The subject of transcendentalism has many interpretations, and I can only give you the one that most appeals to me. There are two general approaches to the subject. One is academic and the other is non-academic. The academic phase is expounded by such thinkers as René Descartes, and the non-academic by the American transcendentalist uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So we have two schools, one founded in an academic approach and the other in a mystical approach. Now, in my, in my mind, the academic approach is false to the subject for one reason. You cannot make an academic approach to mysticism. It is itself a conflicting approach to the subject under consideration. Transcendentalism has been described as a philosophical and religious democracy. It approaches things not from the standpoint of authority, but of internal enlightenment. According to Buddha, who was in this phase of the subject, definitely a transcendentalist, the individual must work out his own way of life. His directives must come from within himself. He cannot be completely under the leadership of an authoritarian religion. In other words, he cannot continue to exist within a pattern of dogmatic uh, religious institutionalism. He does not wish to be told by some intermediary what deity wants for man. Then the Ambeses entered into the presence of the great Olympian temple. The priests came out to say to him, we are the servants of this temple, what can we do for you? And the conqueror said, whose house is this? And the priest said, this is the house of God. Then Cambyse says, man, step aside. And he went in alone. Now this, in a sense, expresses a metaphysical point of view. It is a point of view based, definitely, upon the inner experience of reality. That each person is constantly under the guidance of his own inner life. If he is early in the path of wisdom and does not have a very solid foundation, then the guidance from inside is gentle. If he is further advanced and becomes inconsistent with his own principles, then the guidance becomes more severe. And if he wanders too far from the paths of integrity, the guidance becomes dictatorial almost. But it is from himself it is from the fact that within his own soul, the individual has the leadership of his life. Now, this presents a number of interesting questions, some of which are not easily answered. First of all, we must say that from within the individual, there is a constant stream of impulses coming through into the personality. These impulses are not all right or all good. And the concept that everything that comes from the inside is good and everything from the outside is bad simply cannot be sustained by experience. The individual's release of his own internal guidance depends upon a series of pre preparatory disciplines. And now we can think in terms of the Neoplatonists of Alexandria and Athens. In other words, we can only bring out or bring through uh, that which we can dominate by our own integrities. The beginning, therefore, of the inner or mystical experience of life is and must be self-discipline. Self-discipline, in this case, is not based upon an arbitrary theological point of view. 
This discipline is the moderation of personal conduct. It is the individual gaining gradual mastery of, over little things, the daily experiences of living. Discipline is not a magnificent theological adventure. Discipline is a daily arduous preservation of principles. In the, unless the individual has attained discipline, he cannot depend upon the internal pressures of consciousness. He cannot take the soul guidance he needs unless he has made possible the natural and normal expression of the soul power through his daily life. If his outer living is incorrect, if he is in his daily existence inconsistent with soul principles, he then can be deceived by a, a variety of pressures that come not from the soul, but from the misapplication of his own mental and emotional functions. Emotion has become consistently identified with soul power, but many emotions are not soul-centered. They do not arise in the soul. They arise in environment or the appetites of the individual. Therefore, many emotions are selfish, self-centered, destructive. They come from within, but they are not soul-centered. The individual, however, cannot be liberated from the inside out. He must begin by preparing his outer life to receive the true light of soul power. He must therefore overcome the hazards which will destroy or restrict the function of the soul factor. If he has a bad temper, it is a mistake to assume that an abstract spirituality will cure this. If he is selfish, he cannot simply proceed in spite of it. He cannot hope that soul power will overcome his selfishness. He must overcome it himself before the power of the soul can function through him. He must prepare the way. He must cleanse the inside of his own cup. He must do those things in daily life which remove from his daily activities those circumstances which prevent the natural expression of the good within himself. Consequently, we find most mystics who are really serious and do really want to have a breadth of understanding, living very simple lives. One of the great uh, transcendentalists of the 17th century was Jacob Bermy, the shoemaker. He continued to peg shoes to the end of his life. He never made any effort to become superior, to dominate other people, or to found a, so, a sect or a cult. He shared his knowledge with a few friends, and it was not until after his death that his teachings gained general recognition. It is the same in nearly all mystical circumstances. There is no doubt in the world that St. Francis de Assis was a transcendentalist. He was one who was moved from within himself rather than moved by the church hierarchy which dominated his physical existence. Therefore, we may say, uh, in a sense at least, that Buddha was correct when he speaks of the universe as a cosmotheism. In other words, he tells us that existence itself is a cosmic democracy. It is not an autocracy. It is not a divine power ordering all things and human beings simply obeying. In other words, God is not a dictator. God is not pressing the individual against his own will, because the moment a person moves apart from his own will, he is no longer actually expressing himself and can take no credit for virtues that are forced upon him, even if he can practice them. But in most cases, he cannot practice them. If virtues are imposed by theology or by law, 
the individual secretly disobeys them. He continues in his own way, hoping that an organization or an institution or a policy can bestow the spiritual growth that he feels he requires. So in this uh, point of view, each individual is in a sense the master of his own life. If he is not the master of his own life, then he cannot be held responsible for his actions. A person pressed to do that which he does not believe to be right is not responsible uh, for the consequences if he has made every effort that is possible to himself uh, to continue in a proper course of action. Cosmotheism in Buddhism is simply the realization that there are two forms of government, autocracy and democracy. Most systems of theology are autocratic, whereas mysticism and transcendentalism are actually democratic. They allow the individual to realize that when he achieves something worthwhile, the achievement is his. Basically, there is an endowment within him which Emerson and most others have represented as being a divine capacity. The individual has within himself a spark of the infinite. He has within himself a principle, an energy, which enables him to unfold a destiny of his own. This destiny is, of course, conditioned and limited by the universe in which he exists. It is further conditioned by the environment into which he is born. He is not able to be a free agent completely, but he is able to have what Aquinas calls a limited individualism, a limited determinism, the right to choose between those things that he can choose between that which is best for himself. But if he makes the choice himself, then it is his responsibility, his opportunity, and his consequence. If this choice is forced upon him by others, then the power to grow himself is frustrated. So we have in metaphysical the transcendentalism the concept of the individual having the right, the inalienable right, to grow according to the dictates of his own conscience. He has a right to select that which is the greatest good for him. Now it may well be that he is not able to make such a decision. He does not know what is good for himself. He does not know whether the things he wants are proper or improper. He does not know the difference between aspiration and ambition. He is not sure how much he should sacrifice of worldliness in order to attain a condition of inward enlightenment. These decisions he is not certain about. He is not aware of how far he can trust his own nature. The answer, of course, is that he can trust his own nature to a very great degree if he does not permit superficial and unimportant factors to dominate him. So the Greeks and the Egyptians placed disciplines upon the person, disciplines that were not intended to dogmatize, disciplines that were not given to him by a hierarchy in order to force virtue upon him, but disciplines to make him capable of the self-direction of his own life. One of the problems that we, nearly everyone has to struggle with is the difference between ambition and aspiration. Ambition is usually a very physical, very mortal type of pressure. Ambition makes us want to be a leader over others. Aspiration makes us want to be true to the self within us. Ambition, therefore, ends in worldly controls aspiration in the disciplines of inner life. Uh, one of the great Ill Illumines of the past pointed out definitely that uh, one of the safeguards to prevent us from making the mistake between ambition and aspiration uh, is to realize humility. 
Humility is the individual placing himself under the control of good, so far as he is capable of determining good. He is gradually invited to cast off the restrictions and limitations of his own negative attitudes. He is taught the importance of truthfulness, of gentleness, of service, and of cooperation. And he is warned against this desperate search for spirituality, which has been one of the great causes of man's material culture. He also has to realize that the obstacles to his growth are not primarily in his environment, but within himself. And it is man's personal environment, his body, his emotions, and his mental attitudes that must be organized must be relaxed into a state of cooperation. In other words, he must gain the power to release soul in conduct, in daily relationship with people. He must learn to love the beautiful and serve the good. He must become unselfish. He must protect himself against all destructive attitudes. These things come first. Therefore, in the ancient mystery system, the whole concept was discipline. But the discipline was not to bring him under the authority of the temple or under the domination of the gods. The discipline was for the purpose of releasing his own divinity from within himself. And until the release is from the inside, no essential growth is possible. No one can grow for someone else, nor can someone else grow for him. Man cannot bestow enlightenment upon man. The only thing that the wise can do is invite the individual to control himself. Now this is contrary to many of the precepts and doctrines which have dominated human life for thousands of years. We have depended almost entirely upon a few leaders to make our lives safe. We appoint representatives and expect them to express us. This is a materialistic policy, we probably cannot overcome it immediately, but no leader can save his following. The only thing he can do is invite his following to save themselves and to provide them the reasonable opportunities to express the, bo the boast of their own inner life. This being the case, the teacher is not one who gives the instruction primarily. He is only the one who gives the person a certain number of basic rules to live by, which if followed intelligently and with dedication, will help the person to help himself. In a democracy, we must all grow. We cannot depend for our security upon the growth of one or two persons. We cannot elect a leader who can be a substitute for the leadership of our own inner life. Uh, Emerson, Thoreau, and several of the group of the New England Boston Transcendentalists were persons who had, who had, had previously uh, very orthodox religious backgrounds. But there was a gradual rebellion arising within them. Emerson rebelled against the domination of a more or less rigid uh, clergy. And all over the world, people today are striving to rescue religion from theology. Theology was something in which religion served as an autocrat. Theology was what determined the individual's conduct by the will of a, an ecclesiastical hierarchy. In the Middle Ages, if he didn't conform, he was burned at the stake. There was not the intent to in, uh, help him to release himself. He must obey a rule or a canon. He must do what he was told to do. And this rule or canon constituted integrity. If he disobeyed the rule or the canon, he was subject to a heavy penalty. Therefore, the decision was not because of his love of God, but because of his fear of being burned at the stake. 
This was contrary to all basic religious insights and therefore caused uh, a gradual rebellion leading ultimately to the Protestant Reformation. Actually, the Protestant churches, to a measure, have taken on this transcendentalism. There is less and less dogmatism in them. And in the groups such as the Friends and the Quakers, we find an almost complete lack of ecclesiastical organization. In, the, in many of these uh, groups, the individual allows whatever is his own highest conviction to come through. And he is satisfied to live with this and try to grow accordingly. There is much to be said for a very simple religious belief. And I think for most people it is the only security in these troubled times. There has been a great deal of emphasis upon finding shortcuts to enlightenment, using all kinds of escape mechanisms and defense mechanisms, and assume that these come from inside. We must realize, however, that a very great part of psychic phenomena arises, yes, from the inside, but not from the soul core. It arises from frustrations of one kind or another, escape mechanisms, defenses, and to a measure, hallucination. The actual problem, therefore, of growing is to settle down to the keeping of the rules. And these rules are not difficult, and as one uh, philosopher observed not long ago, namely the history is the great example of keeping and breaking rules. And wherever the rules of human relationships are broken, history becomes violent. Wherever the individual follows the best part of himself, he comes to the nearest security that he can attain in this world. So here we have the definite problem of weeding out what constitutes, to most people, information from inside. They want to believe that dreams or visions or symbols or some uh, mysterious uh, arrangement of psychic pressures is very important. It is only important if the individual, uh, individual who receives it is already a well-organized individual. In other words, the visions of a neurotic are not trustworthy, regardless of how we want to think about it. Also, in a great many cases of frustration, dreams are merely a statement symbolically of the frustration and not a cure for it. And in most cases, these uh, pressures, these visions, these messages are aimed at making the mistake important and telling the individual that he's right and other people are wrong. If he's wrong himself, he will try to escape just as he would in ordinary physical living. If he wants to escape the responsibility of admitting that he is wrong, he goes into an elaborate de uh, defense of his own attitudes or tries to push the responsibility onto someone else. Now the mind and emotions do, uh, do the same thing. The mind, when cornered with a mistake, fights to defend it or to transform it or to transfer it to someone else. The curing of the mistake is not part of the attitude. In our daily living, a person who is subject to excessive temper fits is not nearly as interested in correcting these attitudes as he is in trying to prove that other people are responsible for his bad disposition. It is not that he has a bad disposition, but that other people irritate him beyond his control. This has been explained so many millions of times, also thousands of times from the psychologist's couch, that there is no question of what it means. The person is trying desperately to be right, even when he is thoroughly wrong. To get to understand this thorough wrongness is not easy, but nature does its best for us at all times. Because each of us has an individual relationship with life, if we pervert these qualities of our own natures, various hurts and disappointments come in. The individual with a bad disposition ultimately has to live alone. 
The individual who breaks all the good rules and habits of health gets sick earlier than those who are a little better organized. Individuals who determine to lock themselves in their own ideas pass through life with practically no growth of any kind and have simply wasted 70 or 80 years of their own time and the taxpayer's money. Actually, unless the individual grows, he has no reason to be here. And the individual does not grow because he's already right. He is not here because he is perfect. Here again, Buddha pointed out a very important purpose. We're not here because we're right. We're here because of the unfinished business in ourselves. And we will be back as long as the business remains unfinished. And the individual trying to escape responsibility, trying to have a life of fun, depending upon bad habits for his pleasures, and devoting himself entirely to the accumulation of worldly goods in a universe where these are of no importance whatsoever, does not have a good life. Now, you say, for instance, that uh, we, they come to me frequently and they bring the name of a dozen teachers and ask me which one is authentic. The one that's authentic is the one inside, if you give it a chance. Now, if someone comes along and says, I can help you uh, to reach into yourself by discipline, you might have a little confidence in them. But if that confidence is to remain, they have to do that very, very thing. And in these days of highly competitive metaphysics, the, the emphasis is nearly always on making everything as easy as possible for the follower so that he will not search elsewhere and will remain. It is not the basic uh, intention of these things to make life strictly correct. The individual who has a bad disposition can go through all kinds of religious organizations and still have it. Nothing has been done to make him change. Now, you can't point a finger at him and say, change. Uh, this would probably result in a riot. But what you can do is to recognize that anyone who is a fit leader is gently but firmly impelling you to change. Not compelling, but impelling. The uh, sincere leader wants to liberate a follower, not to attach him. He wants the individual to grow into his own fullness, or as far as he can go. It is not likely that he's going to develop all his potentials in any one embodiment. But he should leave this world better than he gets into it. And the only way he can be better is because he has released more of good from within himself. It is this good from within himself that helps him to grow. Now, in order to increase this probability of good and encourage growth, man is faced with responsibility. His life is very often a mass of duties. He is continually being beset by situations that are difficult. So these become, in a sense, his trials, his tests, his obligations. The reason why he is beset with these difficulties is because he has not handled situations correctly. The situation that is difficult arises usually from his own inability to handle something that might have been good. Nature does not send false evils to us. Nature does not afflict us with anything that is beyond our comprehension to work with and finally to normalize. We are not simply being beaten by some strange cosmic force that wishes to bear down on us until we can't stand it any longer. All of these things require certain adjustments from within ourselves. And mysticism in general teaches the importance of adjustments, the importance of making things uh, what they should be through a gradual process of enlightenment. The moment a problem arises, we have to estimate our own resources. Whatever we are, whoever we are, and whatever the problem is, the answer is in ourselves. Of this there can be no doubt. Whatever situation that we face can be dominated by our own inner convictions. We can solve any problem in one of several ways. 
Now here's another situation that arises. The individual, wishing to solve a problem, decides for himself how that solution must be attained. He knows what the solution is that he wants. But as Pythagoras says, every man knows what he wants, but only God knows what he needs. Therefore, in an effort to achieve a solution, we think in terms of comfort, release from responsibility, pleasure, or profit. Whereas nature is interested in achievement, in the strengthening of the internal resources of the person. Actually, if we look around ourselves, we will find that we live in a world in which certain dictatorial attitudes have become prevalent. Nations, leaders of all degrees and all, and all magnitudes are attempting to control each other. We wish to dominate a world politically, economically, scientifically, socially, uh, religiously. The difference between a great political movement and a great religious movement is only the particular fact or form of domination that each exercises. It is not our comfort or our happiness or our growth that is the final consideration. Somebody wants to govern other people, wants to control them, exploit them, use them, and if necessary, destroy them if they have refused to obey. This is an, a wrong attitude to begin with, and therefore as long as nations or individuals dominate in this way, the tragedy will never end. It is not the domination of another, but the direction of ourselves that is the reason for evolution as far as man is concerned. So when you start in with this problem, you begin by assuming one point, which uh, we all have to have faith in something. Faith is the beginning of effort. Faith is that attitude in ourselves that is supported by the highest traditions of the race, the greatest experiences of the past, and those things held most sacred and dear to our own hearts and souls. Faith, therefore, must have a proper integration, a proper point of view. There are two forms of faith that are important to us. One is faith in universal integrity, and the other is faith in the possibility of personal self-unfoldment. If the individual believes that the universe is honest, then there is no longer any reason for his own dishonesty. If he believes that there is within himself a divine spark or a flame or a light, then he has the faith to do something about it. So faith is the acceptance of an honorable hypothesis. Faith is something that must be accepted first and proven by experience later. If our faith is wrong to start with, we can be very embittered and may are likely to blame the religion we belong to or the world we live in. But faith is basically the individual's acceptance of a law of universal love and justice. With this in the back of the mind, he can also gain a great example from history. History is the proof of faith. It has been said that the Christian Bible is the basis of a great hope for mankind, of and of mankind. And it is a book of faith strengthening. It doesn't tell you all the things you want to know. In fact, it tells you very little. But it strengthens your realization or belief that there is a good, that there is a reason for self, that there is a destiny toward which we are all laboring with varying degrees of success. But faith begins in the term of mysticism by simple recognition that the individual can grow and can accomplish all good that is necessary to himself. Also, that this faith is best manifested 
through a complete pattern of unselfish dedication to principles. That the individual also, in the process of learning, must learn, as many have in the course of years, that the most important of all religious exercises is service. The individual who forgets himself comes nearer to his own soul. The individual who is always thinking of himself and his own rights, his own privileges, and his own uh, abilities is usually not internally enlightened. It is the forgetting of self in the fulfillment of the law that brings us closer and closer to inner potential. Actually, according to Emerson, and I think this is equally true of the other schools, Neoplatonism, as it is found in Athens, in Proclus, and in Alexandria through Plotinus, Iamblichus, and other great Neoplatonists. These teachers took a theology uh, that had descended to them from Plato, principally, and they gradually adapted it uh, to a complete dedication to the highest possible concepts of human life. They were the ones who emphasized most of all uh, the tremendous importance of simple sincerity in the strengthening of the spiritual life. Most of these people were philosophers and had philosophical backgrounds. But philosophy is a very broad term. Philosophy does not necessarily mean one of the schools such as we know today. Most of these schools now at loggerheads with each other. It does not mean a sheer intellectualism in which we try to rationalize ourselves into a state of grace. Philosophy is nothing more or less than organized idealism. idealism. It is the individual uh, using the inner values of his own life to create what he calls common sense. Common sense is simply the most natural and most obviously correct way of directing a life. Common sense is the most uncommon of all sensory perceptions, but it arises when the individual begins to cast off superficial and, for the most part, impossible or irrational hypotheses and settles down to the common circumstances of life. Common sense has been likened to childhood because in the early years of life the individual has not been spoiled. And what we call growing up is largely the destruction of our own inner lives. Not destruction in the sense of a final annihilation, but the prevention of these inner values from coming through. Children, and small children especially, are normally friendly, kindly, and affectionate. They are trusting. They believe in things. And it is only when they are gradually educated out of their own faith that we have more and more trouble with them. We have in the metaphysics, especially in mysticism, the quiet way, the way of peaceful growth through the acceptance of responsibility, through a quiet fulfillment of all duties, and for a complete control of our own attitudes. Mysticism, by quieting the inner life, by taking away from it all the pressures and inconsistencies and absurdities with which we burden it, allows the truth to come through. In other words, it is another statement of what it says in the Bible, Be still and know that I am God. If we are quiet enough in the outer life, the inner life comes through. We hear the voice of the silence. We hear the gradual revelation of the nobility within ourselves, not as words, but as very quiet values and strength, and an increasing courage to keep the rules. In the uh, transcendentalist system of thinking, the mystical experience, or the experience of man's relationship to deity, is not something that comes uh, as a reward for a specialized training. 
It is a reward simply for the life of virtue, what uh, Confucius calls the life of the superior person, the person who is so integrated in himself that he is incapable of being over-influenced uh, by the corruptions of his environment. The gentle person, completely relaxed, but not negative, is the one in whom the soul power or the inner life is the greatest possibility of manifesting itself. One thing, of course, that most people have gotten into trouble with is the conflict between the ego and the soul. The ego, or the I am, me and mine, does not represent the true self. It has been demonstrated in nearly all systems of learning, mysticism, psychology, and religion that the ego is a false god. The ego is simply the superficial uh, summary of undigested experiences and unenlightened attitudes. The ego is a kind of self. It is the self that says, gimme, I want, I must have. The type of ego is that which tears down others to build up self. Ego has concern with riches, wealth, social standing, and very often with dissipation. The ego is a personal self allowed to dominate the impersonal self locked within it. The ego is the superficial outside of the human personality. It is that which most commonly dominates conduct and therefore most commonly mutilates conduct. The difference between the ego and the soul is that the ego lives in this world, thinks in terms of it, expects nothing beyond it, and wants to build into this material existence every satisfaction that is conceivable. There is no long-range plan, because to the ego there is no long-range because to the ego there is no long range. There is simply the immediate comfort, whether it be by dissipation or by damaging other people. Uh, the ego is the source of crime. It is the source of practically every delinquency of the individual. These delinquencies arising from various negative attitudes or from the simple desire to succeed without effort. The individual who does not want to earn what he has and tries to take it some other way is a victim of his own ego. Of a sudden, the fallacy of it all bursts upon him. He can no longer live with his own external. The internal, frustrated perhaps for many lives, is gradually demanding attention because the external becomes increasingly uncomfortable. After you abuse the body long enough, it fights back. If you abuse life long enough, it turns against you. And sometimes in an emergency of that type, there is an extension of consciousness. This is the way in which most mystics interpret the conversion of St. Paul, who suddenly reversed his position because something happened whereby he was able to dominate his own ego and to transmute himself into a servant rather than being a master over outer things. He became a servant of inner things. Now this sense of ego as uh, in conflict with the soul causes us again to ask a little bit more about the soul. Emerson and the Neoplatonists of Alexandria and Athens were of one mind on this particular uh, point. The soul is a transcendent being, and this transcendent being is the key to the transcendentalist concept of life. The soul is that seed of eternity which is sown in man at the time of his creation. It is the seed of the life that goes on from generation to generation. It is this seed which is transmitted from parent to child and from child to their child. All this is that life principle which is within the human being, which is not only a principle of vitality, but which has blocked within it the laws of its own proper existence. 
This uh, realization makes it possible for the individual to assume correctly that there is within himself a transcendent being, a being that is his own true self. Paul says, the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. The soul, in a sense, is the Christ in you, the divine power without which you couldn't exist at all, but which you never or seldom, if ever, understand correctly. This internal thing is the thing that gives you life, but most people use it to perpetuate death. This inner power, therefore, must be cultivated, and it is cultivated by the idea of st storing up treasures in heaven, heaven in this case being the inner life. The Greeks, Plotinus and Proclus, point out very clearly that the soul within the individual is the power not only to lead the life into the correct paths, but the power also to appreciate that which is good outside of self. The individual is not only having an enemy inside himself, his own appetites, but he has an enemy outside of himself, his ignorance and misinterpretation of his world. The individual who measures his world only in what it has done for him or to him is wrong. The individual who takes it for granted uh, that life is impossible, and that it is his moral duty to, con to criticize and condemn, has simply missed the entire principle. So man, looking around him, is deceived by his environment, and looking within him can be deceived by his appetites. To overcome this and to rationalize this situation properly, there must be an opportunity for the individual to experience the sublimity of the good. Actually, all great works of beauty in nature have been done by the soul. This is the soul that has inspired the great art, the great music, the great literature. It is the soul that has made great humanitarians, it has given us the martyrs and the saints. It is the soul in the individual that doeth the works that are important and right and proper. The soul locked in the average individual, therefore, is at a disadvantage because it does not know how to cope with these problems. So the Neoplatonists say, said, instead of simply trying to go to the temple and pray for something, uh, go around and look and see the temple in the world around you. See beauty in its own place in nature. It is more important, perhaps, to stand by the side of a beautiful valley and look out upon the wonders of life and realize how beautiful nature really can be. The beauties of nature help us to appreciate and understand the large plan of things. As we look upon a beautiful scene, we realize that the creator of all things put together a universe which is beautiful simply because it is correct and is doing exactly what it is supposed to do, and man is not quite so beautiful because he is not doing what he is supposed to do. And in doing the wrong thing, he has disfigured himself. Nature, therefore, according to Plotinus, tells us to love the beautiful, and that wherever nobility or beauty exists, the soul moves towards it. Now this is very important because the great uh, religious uh, realities of life have been given to us in terms of beauty. The great cathedral is an architectural masterpiece, a magnificence of stone and stained glass, a wonderful thing. And when you come into it, you are quiet because the very wonder of it impresses you. A great painting is a wonderful experience. And a painting, as the Zen masters in Japan pointed out, a painting is not just a thing, a painting is alive. For nothing that is not alive can influence anything else. So it is the life in the picture taken in by your soul power that helps you to grow. The same is true of a great book or a great piece of music. It is equally true of a very simple person in whom you can see the virtues and values that you are not able to possess yourself. All things that are beautiful draw from life 
and draw your own soul out from the lockness of itself. Beauty releases soul power, and it brings into play what Emerson calls the overself. It is the power to bring forth out of yourself sublimity. Beauty may break, cause you to break into tears because you cannot handle its emotional pressures. It may cause you a great exaltation or may cause you a great depression because you're not able to handle it. But beauty is a, an instrument for the release of soul power. And beauty is not only in things but in qualities. Love is beautiful. Hate is ugly. Uh, beautiful ideals and emotions. Kindness is beautiful. Forgiveness is beautiful. All the things which arise from the impulses to be better or to share good, all these things are beautiful. And yet many of the most beautiful things in the world are the commonest. There is nothing possibly more beautiful in all the world than the leaves of a weed or some ordinary thing. For there is nothing that does not ultimately reveal the soul power working through material nature. And it is our own soul power working through human nature that must gradually grow if we ever hope for peace, security, or integrity in this tired and rather confused world. The, the transcendentalists, therefore, were cultivating and much more interested in the beautiful. They wanted to live simply. They realized that the more you have, the more trouble you have. Thoreau worked that all out to his own satisfaction at Walden Pond. He knew the beauty of, the, of gentleness. He wasn't able to live it always. Emerson wasn't able to live it always. No one is completely free from the pressures which restrict the integrities. There is no one is as completely perfect. But everyone is trying to take the next step forward. If you try to make a big leap, you're liable to fall down. But a little step you can take every day will gradually give release to the soul power. In other words, it's what the alchemist said or meant when he said it will open the door of the shut palace of the king. It is the opening of the inner life, allowing it to come out. When you're not afraid to be yourself, when you're not afraid that you will be misunderstood, as long as you are playing games with your own mind, you will be misunderstood. But when you are truly gentle, have great faith, and the kindness of your soul comes through in its full value, you know when to speak and when to be silent. You know what to say and why it should be said. And you are not involved in any effort to avenge yourself, revenge yourself, or dominate the thinking of another person. Everything moves in a very quiet way. And it is this path of the quiet way which is true mysticism. Mysticism is not something that you get by all kinds of fancy doctrines. It is not something that you rationalize or intellectualize. Mysticism is simply allowing the best of yourself to govern the rest. And when this happens, then you are truly a transcendentalist. You are a person in whom the spiritual values of life have gradually been released into their own maturity. Also, of course, it is rather obvious that if we believe in life after death, it is the degree of growth that we have achieved that we take with us. It is this degree of growth also. The peace that we have here comes to be the peace that we have in the life beyond. The early saints of the church were very much concerned with this thought. They believed that as this world is a terror to the ignorant, so life beyond the grave will be a terror to the ignorant when they die. But if the individual here has learned to love life, serve other people, be gentle, kind, and thoughtful, he will awaken beyond the grave in a world of peace and quietude, because it is his own life. The afterlife is merely an expression of his own life here while he is trying to grow. Now, in the effort to grow, people get all mixed up. As natural, because for some unknown reason, the last several hundred years, growth has been seriously retarded. Probably the cause for it all is karma. 
because there are many entities have been coming in here in the last hundred years that were involved in the tragedies of the previous 2,000 years. Man did not grow easily or generously or happily. He grew through wars and privations and pestilence and catastrophe, and he grew by constantly, by constantly serving his own selfish purposes. Here we have it today. Today, as never perhaps before in the recorded history of the world, success is the only thing that counts. And is the only success is in this world. The only success is to have that extra house now, the yacht, the swimming pool. These are success. And for these, the individual is perfectly willing to compromise his integrities. And you ask him why, and he says, well, why shouldn't I? Everyone else does. This is where the individual, however, is mistaken. What everyone else does has no in actual influence upon him unless he permits it to. The thing that counts with each individual is to retain his own integrities. And there's never been a better opportunity than right now to retain them, because they are slipping away very fast. Yet it is this very slipping away that in the last 25 years has caused the greatest resurgence in religion, I guess, in the last thousand years. More and more people are realizing that something is wrong. More and more people are having trouble living with their own way of life. And uh, in government, we find constant anxiety at these points in our history. The great rebellion that is arising against nuclear armament and all these things, we bear witness to the fact that the soul is still there and is trying to speak. It is determined to accomplish certain things. The human being is potentially better than his way of life today will permit. But he cannot depend upon the changing of society to improve himself. Everyone has said that in a better world he could live better, and that if we were in heaven already we'd be perfect. Unfortunately, it isn't true. The better world is of no value to us unless we are able to live in it constructively. If the better world would simply become a way where we could have more and do less, we would be worse off than we are now. Work is becoming an odious thing, so we are meeting it with every kind of a mechanical device we can think of. And all these things are going to turn on us. Because our motives are wrong, our intentions are not correct as far as personal character is concerned, we are looking for laziness rather than growth. We are looking to save money by unemploying people. We are also looking for shortcuts to almost every kind of material advantage we can think of. Our crime weight is high, our narcotics addiction is high, our alcoholism is high. All of these things bear witness to the fact that the individual is refusing to permit his, to permit his own soul to function. Nature's correction of this is that whatever we do that is against the right that we should be doing will ultimately come back and hit us. We are going to gradually find that the only peace in the world is to keep the rules, and that the keeping the rules means that friendship, kindness, and cooperation must become the basis of human relationships. We cannot be a competitive people and survive. We cannot break the faith without the faith damaging us. And all of our attitudes affect not only the soul within us, but the body. Because, as the ancients pointed out, the healthy body is made possible by the constructive qualities of the soul. A soul that is enlightened can protect the body from a great many sorrows. It won't prevent it from passing on gradually as is its way. But the soul controlling the body gives us the maximum health and longevity. And the soul uh, dominating the mind makes us constructive, cheerful, and kind. And the control of the soul over the emotions makes us loving, affectionate, friendly, and uh, moderate in all appetites. All these things help to make a person. It is this blocking of the soul that gives us religious intolerance. It breaks homes. It leaves parents and children isolated. It does all the things we do not want to have happen. And wherever we break the soul's laws, we suffer and we are sad. We weep. 
we, we realize that something is desperately wrong. Uh, there is no pleasure left in life for us because all our affairs go badly. But we people do not realize, apparently, that this is all due to the fact that we have declared war upon the best of ourselves. We are determined to destroy that which prevents us from doing what we please. And as that which we want to destroy is the only indestructible part of ourselves, that we come in the end to a stalemate. The uh, Neoplatonists of Alexandria, uh, discovered in the works of Plato, uh, the idea of a great religious system. We are told by Proclus of, uh, of Athens, who was the last of the Platonic successors, that Plato's philosophy was the outer cover for a religion. And therefore, Proclus in his books on the theology of Plato lets us know that in the closing years of his life, Plato transformed his whole philosophy into a way of life, a very simple way, that the end of philosophy is that the individual shall experience the divinity of life. That philosophy is not an end but a means, and that the end of all philosophy is that man shall love the beautiful, serve the good, and honor the integrities of existence. That philosophy gives us our first basic understanding of the true nature of God. And that by philosophy we can justify the correction of our own imperfections. We can find a natural theology. A theology that is supported by natural law, that is obvious in the world wherever we look around us, it is the actual integrity by which every function of existence is maintained. The Alexandrian Neoplatonists took this concept and began to interpret again philosophy in terms of a great internal discipline, an experience of, of universal integrities. Philosophy was not destroyed by this. Uh, mysticism does not destroy as a philosophy. It consummates it as far as philosophy itself is honorable. Philosophy shows us many of the truths which help us to have the courage to go out and live well. But to end in an argument concerning abstractions is to destroy the essential value of philosophy. Philosophy is not a mere intellectualism. It is not something in which the individual trying desperately to be wise uh, fails in all of his values of life. Philosophy is simply the outer chamber of a great universal system. It is one of the outside steps leading into a temple. Uh, philosophy is therefore perhaps summed up in man's discovery that all things are reasonable, all things are just, and all things move inevitably to the fulfillment of their ordainment by divinity. So this concept of a philosophical theology in which the individual grew rather than received absolution vicariously, this philosophy that became Neoplatonism and later so influenced Emerson and the school in Concord Mass was simply a realization that there was a natural way of doing things that is not spectacular, that is not full of fads, that does not require the individual to viciously attack things that do not seem to work out to his particular satisfaction, but a philosophy that is natural, kindly, good-natured, and peaceful. It is said on one occasion that Emerson, in an effort to uh, prove his democracy, so to say. After all, he was the great uh, American Brahmin, very much tradition-bound. But he uh, thought that as a great evidence uh, that he should have the maid and the servant in the house eat with the family at meals as a sign of the recognition of democracy. After about three or four times of this experience, the maid and the housekeeper asked to be relieved of this responsibility, as they had much more pleasure eating quietly by themselves, and not becoming involved too much in family affairs. 
but apparently Emerson got the message. He realized, therefore, that his effort was wrong. He had tried to make a symbolic example of something, but he had not sensed the realities of life. He learned more from the fact that they didn't want to eat at the table than in anything else that he could have gained in the form of satisfaction for his statement of democracy. Things have to be what they are, but everything is what it is and can be beautiful. There is no reason why any truth should hurt anybody. The only person it can hurt is the person who doesn't believe in truth. But, on the other hand, to go around making cruel remarks against other people, this isn't a matter of truth. This is always ulteriorly motivated. There is spite, there is vengeance, there is uh, some type of ulterior motive whenever we are unkind. We are trying to get some kind of satisfaction. We are trying to fulfill something in ourselves at the expense of other people. Neoplatonism and mysticism do not work on this particular level or in this type of thinking. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of groups coming, springing up now on all kinds of religious principles. Some of them are very good, some of them are maybe good, and some of them are obviously not good, but they are all based upon some concept of something. All of them, finally, to fulfill a constructive purpose, <clears throat> must come back to the same rules. No system uh, can grow or help other people to grow unless it helps the individual to correct his own mistakes. Unless he is impelled to be a better person, no organization can make him one. No organization can save him by taking him out of the thundering herd and isolating him on the top of a mountain. No uh, divine plan can be fulfilled through the use of narcotics. All these various shortcuts, all these various original ideas, some of them are the result of metaphysical speculation, some of them probably have psychic uh, activity. But any system that does not make the basic requirement, the requirement of self-improvement, and self-improvement in this case not becoming wiser in worldly things, but becoming better in the virtues of life. No system that does not teach the individual to escape from the pressure of his own attitudes can do anything of very permanent value. We have to break through the shell we have built, the shell of our own infallibility, the shell of our own uniqueness, the shell that we have been picked out by destiny for some noble purpose. All these attitudes must be gradually overcome. It is only when we overcome these things and become what we ought to be, natural human beings, that, the, that nature or the infinite can use us for some major purpose or project. Those who have done the most for the world have been those who have forgotten themselves and their own spirituality and tried to work every day for the benefit of the people. We also must expect no rewards. The reward is not in anything except growth. The final reward for the good deed is growth. We become better people. And because we are better people, we can do more for others. The whole problem of growth, therefore, is one of it being self-rewarding or self-fulfilling. We grow and in so doing become a little wiser, a little better, a little more beautiful within ourselves. Actually, according to the Greeks and the Egyptians, the human soul is the link between spirit and body. It represents the middle distance between the exterior world and the internal. Through the soul, the eternal moves into the temporal. Through the soul, the divine root of life becomes a tree and spreads downward to become the mortal world in which we live. All things are in their middle distances soul. That is why everything in its natural state is beautiful. The stars are beautiful, the sky is beautiful, the earth is beautiful. They are all symbols of a beauty which is normalcy, order, integrity, and justice. 
The soul, therefore, links man's spiritual and material life. In alchemy, it is the transforming and transmuting agency. It is that power by means of which it is possible for the human being to transcend himself. It is his link with the infinite. It is that part of his own nature which alone can survive, which alone can fulfill, and alone can solve all the problems of existence, and solve them by the simple realization that there are no problems except the ones he creates himself. So man living in a beautiful universe has a right to enjoy it. He has a right to share in it and be part of it and live with it. He has a right to have the natural joys of life. But he also has the problem to realize that any pleasure that is detrimental to his own nature or damaging to any other person cannot be a true uh, jo source of comfort or consolation. The individual cannot be selfish and grow. He cannot nurse his own temperament and outgrow it. On the other hand, people have tried for years to fight against themselves. And very often this is a terrible fight. It is a, a fight against shadows. It is a, a tremendous resistance against demons of formless or mindless structure. To fight against this selfishness does not seem to do any good. The individual simply becomes more and more neurotic. He always wanted to do something. He disciplines himself by not doing it, and he gets sick. Therefore, he cannot intellectually and willfully dominate his own personality any more than he can dominate his world. The only answer lies not in this fight against that which is not right, but the quiet acceptance of that which is right. Instead of opposing evil, we strengthen good. And then when we strengthen good, we discover that evil is only a shadow. It is only a not-being, which we have mistaken for a reality because it had within it certain values which we liked, but which had no permanent place in the universal policy of things. If they begin to grow, the evil slips away. We no longer wish that which is not good once we have really discovered the importance of being right in things. Now the uh, problem of the release of the soul is in a sense an experience which Protinus in Alexandria and Proclus both mentioned. It is a moment, maybe, only a moment, as we find it mentioned in Havelock Ellis' Dance of Life. It is an instant in which the tremendous nature of the internal is made known to us. And every effort to describe it has been futile. No one can describe in words that which is a divine fact. In those moments, the individual, in a few, in a few seconds, can have an experience that changes his whole life. It is a, an experience, the first contact we have with the infinite. It is a, suddenly, a sudden awareness of the divi of divinity within ourselves. And that divinity comes in great quietude, great gentleness, and, and eternal peace. It is not approaching in glory or in power or authority or majesty. It is suddenly the experience of the infinite love that governs all things. The divine power of eternal right and the realization that all the sufferings and problems we go through are necessary because through them and through them alone can we discover this ultimate right. This power that is much more potent than anything we know. From the moment of that experience, as Protinus tells us, there can be no doubt about anything that is good. There can be no deviation from the path of righteousness. There can be no temptation because there is nothing left in man to tempt. He has achieved that which at all, and he will no longer settle for some partial success in some minor detail. The uh, actual experience in the same thing as we find in the Oriental system, 
uh, we find in the writings of the various early Christian saints. This, this ecstasis, this momentary participation, this oneness at one month with the eternal. It only lasts a few seconds, and then we're back again in the old world we were in before. But that which comes back into that world can never be the same. There is something now that is entirely different. Temptations don't exist, because no temptation can exist when the individual becomes aware of the totality of available good. There is nothing he needs anymore, because he has fulfilled his own greatest need, and that is the realization of the presence of God within himself. Little by little, therefore, these Neoplatonists work toward helping uh, themselves and each other to finally submerge their own identities in the divine love. And they, they did not create a great system of temples or, ch or shrines. They did not even become an acknowledged faith in the world. They simply became a way of growing that anyone can take that wants to, anywhere. It cannot be theologized, it cannot be organized, it cannot be sold, and it cannot be bought. It is a simple experience of releasing through the simple daily deeds of life that grandeur which is locked within everything. Just as the flower passes from the bud to full bloom and then has its seed, so the soul unfolding comes to full glory and then bears its eternal fruit in the redemption of man. This type of thinking uh, seemingly is more or less needed right now. A great many people probably aren't going to get it right away, but more are reaching for it than ever before. They are no longer so much interested in sects and creeds. They are no longer so much interested in the old traditional forms of worship. But they have a great need, a great spiritual need of the immediate presence of God. They need to have an experience of some kind that forever destroys or overcomes or eliminates or completely dissolves the insecurities of life. That the individual then lives also in an eternal life. One moment of enlightenment and the individual becomes inter eternal. Not because he'll be in the body all the time, but because that moment reveals to him the eternality of himself. He is an undying, immutable, inevitable being. He always has been and he always held, will be. And when he knows this firmly, it makes no difference whether he is born or dies. The eternal continuity of life preserved forever in the love of God. That all forms are manifestations of a great system of spiritual enlightenment and education. We are so blessed by the plan as it is that we can ask no better. The only difficulty is we have to discover the blessing. We have to realize that the thing as it is, is right, and that the only way we can change it still more and make it more right is by being right ourselves. And as we grow and master the problems of existence, we are never expected to face the same problem twice. Once we have had victory over a problem, it ceases. When we have a, victim, a victory over materiality, it ceases. When we have a victory over the wilderness, wilderness in ourselves, we have victory and we have escape and defense at the same time. We are free of that which we do well and slave to that which we do not do well. Therefore, it is our constant duty and responsibility to learn more and more to do everything well that we possibly can. And in a very quiet, peaceful, and gentle way, to go along growing as nature would have us grow. This is a very special day as it comes in each year, Mother's Day, and it is part of the great program of realization that all relationships in life are symbolic of soul relation. From the beginning of time, man has worshipped the principle of the Divine Mother. Every religion has had among its most principal deities a great feminine power. Isis, Mary, 
all of these different uh, uh, doctrines worship the principle of life-giving, not only because the mother has been given uh, the right to become the parent of generations, but because in the very act of motherhood, probably more than in any other act in the world today, the woman has the experience of the soul. She has a moment of tremendous release of natural love, of protection, of gentleness, of dedication, of self-sacrifice. And the moment of birth is therefore one of the great mysteries of life and comes perhaps among the natural functions of life, the nearest to the revelation of soul power. In other words, the mother principle is, in a sense, the soul principle itself. And in almost all religions, the soul has been symbolized as feminine. The psyche, though the soul, is a feminine deity. And all in the religions of the world, it is the mother of mysteries. It is the great goddess of the Ephesians. Everywhere it is always a symbol of the soul power because it is peculiarly, manif peculiarly manifested in the experience of motherhood. So that on this day we feel it's perfectly wonderful and right uh, to honor the mothers of the world and to also encourage them to the greater fulfillment of the wonder that is in their keeping and that their own destiny is largely influenced by this. And in the law of reincarnation, the alternation of sexes means in the end, all souls have the double experience of fatherhood and motherhood. And together this becomes a parenthood, which is the parenthood of the soul over the body and the parenthood of, the, of God or the divine power over the soul and the body. All this was part of an ancient belief but it's a wonderful belief, and it is much happier and more cheerful than many of the beliefs that we have today. In other words, Happy Mother's Day to all those. And if you have already uh, come into uh, maturity and had children growing up around you, be grateful. And find in them an also a wonderful opportunity for the development of your own soul potential. And fathers, don't leave them out. They're in the picture, too. They may have to wait till next embodiment, however, to go through it. In the meantime, thank you very much.